The Tom Woods Show, episode 1409, bonus episode. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. What a delight this is for me, and I hope for you also. I'm joined today by two people, special guest co-host today, Brad Berzer. You know Brad from previous episodes in which we've discussed history, but we've also, at least in the more distant past, discussed music on this show together. And Brad is an authority when it comes to progressive rock, having been with the Progarchy website for quite some time. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the program today David Longdon, who is the lead vocalist for Big Big Train, which is by far the best band you've never heard of. It is criminal how underrated they are. Brad and I, I remember Brad telling me when we first talked about them, he honestly thinks they are the best band of the past 20 years, that there's just nobody nobody better. And that is an amazing thing to say. And we also think David Longdon may be the best rock vocalist there is. An amazing thing, right? So here we are talking to him. Big Big Train has a brand new release. Their new album is called Grand Tour. We're going to be talking about that. I'm going to link to some of my favorite music of theirs also at tomwoods.com slash 1409. Of course, I'll have a link where you can get the new album. But this is the kind of music that makes your life better. It improves your life. It doesn't just make you tap your foot a little bit during the day. It improves your life. You will have a better life now that you know about the music of Big Big Train. And we're going to talk about that right now. Brad, I'm glad to have you here with me as co-host and welcome to David Longdon. Thanks to both of you gentlemen. Hello, thanks for having me. Brad and I are just delighted to be talking to you and my kids are envious. My daughters, of of which I have five, have heard you in the car so many times. Uh, they, they know Uncle Jack and the first rebreather and Hedgerow, and Summoned by Bells, by heart. And, and uh, I think you're one of the strongest rock vocalists I've ever heard. I, I think you're just tremendous. And then in preparation for this, I looked at your Wikipedia entry, and you play like 800 instruments. Well, so uh, what's your background? How'd you get started? Uh, well, I was born in Nottingham in the Midlands, and my father was a, a carpenter, <laughs> sounds strange, he was, he was a joiner. And uh, he, he worked on those sort of things. My mum worked in the textiles industries in Nottingham. And uh, music was something that was important. It was considered very important when, uh, culturally when I was growing up. It seemed to be something that I, I particularly gravitated towards. Uh, my mum says that her father um, uh, was a musician. And uh, uh, But at those days, you know, that it was um, the opportunities weren't really there to pursue it. So from a young age, from about eight, I started learning to play the piano. And, uh, and other sort of keyboard type things. So that's how I started. Uh, so I think playing a keyboard is a good thing because it gives you lots of um, ideas of harmony and you can see the harmony in patterns as it moves around, uh, as you move your fingers around the keyboard. It's very easy to see the harmonies. And uh, it was when I got to the age of 14, I realised that I kind of wasn't um, an orchestral player and um, I, I started playing flute in, a, in the school orchestra because we had to play an orchestral instrument to do that so although I was a uh, sight reading and doing things the folk rock band when I was 14 and we were sort of playing in local bars and things like that pubs and things uh which was that was good fun so I kind of ah I'm one of those sorts of musicians and then after that finished I formed my own band with school friends and that after we got we played a few covers there was a need for original material we thought so I was the one that was most likely to be able to provide it so I started writing songs and that's how it started, really. I always considered myself to be a songwriter, a singer and a songwriter first and foremost. So the musical instruments tend to be things that come along in order to flesh out the songs, if that makes sense. That's, that's, that's why I play them. Now, we could spend some time getting into the background of, of Big Big Train and how it got started, but we have you for only so much time, and I selfishly want to focus on things that I think are most likely, well, first of all, that I uh, interest me that I also think are going to get people to start listening to you guys, because I think if people are not listening to Big Big Train, and I'm not even exaggerating, I think your life is worse. I genuinely think your life is worse than if you listened. And in fact, a couple of years ago, I did a little promotion where I took some of my top donors who support my show, and I just sent them copies of English Electric Full Power, 
which I think may be the best album I've ever heard. And I've spent my entire life listening to uh, to material like this. So can I ask you, do you do something else full time other than Big Big Train? I used to teach music technology for about um, 12, 13 years. Um, that's when I had a, a young family. But after that, I work part time. I just do, um, I just, just, come mean, just like menial work, I work part time in a convenience store. So it just gets me a few hours and pay, helps me keep the, the bills in. So, but no, I only, I only do about 18 hours a week in there now. So predominantly I'm, I'm, I'm doing big, big train. That's what, and, and it looks like it's heading more that way. So, which is fine. All right. That's tremendous. I'm, I'm going to turn things over to Brad for a minute. David, it's so good to finally meet you. I know we've corresponded a few times, and of course, I've corresponded with Greg, uh, but yeah. I've never talked to him either. So it, it's wonderful to to be able to connect. And uh, I've been listening to you now uh, for ten years. I mean, this is exactly ten years. Tom and I were talking about this yesterday. Uh, I heard of you from my friend Carl Olson, who runs, who works for Ignatius Press, and then I was the one who told Tom about you, as far as I know. So uh, it's nice to have these links one to another. So again, thank you for being on and doing this. So David, I want to I want to follow up on Tom's question, and I'd like to ask a kind of broader question, and that is when you work with Big Big Train, and obviously you and Spotten have an incredible musical relationship. Yeah, how do you how do you see yourself as a member of a band versus what you did on your solo album? Uh, especially when you're talking about playing the flute and recognizing that you're really not an orchestral type, it's clear you fit in incredibly well in a tight knit band. So, can you give us a little bit about that process, not only from your personal perspective, but maybe from a broader perspective of how it might work in the band dynamic? Well, it's um, it. It does vary a little bit because we have different ways of writing. Although Greg and I have written together in the past on recent records, we tend to write um, apart. Other than if we're working with, we, we worked with Rickard on Grimsbound and did Mead Hall in Winter. Rickard uh, uh, made, wrote a lot of the music. I wrote the melody. Greg wrote the words. And the same things happened with Nick and Di Virgilio on the new record, um, uh, Theodora in, in Green and Gold. And um, so... The way that the way that I fit into it is um, usually um, obviously something like a flute is a very melodic thing, so I can add, add counterpoint melodies to it, and I do write things down because as I've got older, I mean the, the good thing about doing having a formal musical education is that you can write notation, and uh, and so it's it's actually really useful for working out parts alongside something. So I think what I try to do if I'm working on other people's material is I'll try to do something that that enhances the work. Um, and, it, and it can be anything because I tend to I, I really like production as well I, I enjoy the role that I do in, in Big Big Train with, with the production of, of, of the songs that I'm working on and so I'll, I'm, I will do anything that I think enhances the song we've got a rule in Big Big Train which is um, whoever writes the song has the kind of sort of like veto on what, what they think works or, oh nice okay that's, that's uh, I just think it makes it easier otherwise um it's not. I don't think anything's kind of good by committee. You have to have someone with a vision of what's actually happening. Uh, so that makes that makes it a lot easier. So we run we'll run ideas past um, the, the actual songwriter in these instances. But it's just really serving the songs. It's making sure that um, you know that, that if I'm working on a Greg thing, I, when I'm doing vocals on Greg's stuff, he'll give me um, guide vocals. But he, he's very good with saying, well, you know. Can you give me a big vocal moment here? And, ve- and eventually, I'll just do. I'll, I'll react to that, and um, eventually, we'll 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 choose one of one of them we think is the best one. That kind of thing. So, so there's a lot of trust because we've worked together a long time, and there's a lot of trust and um, in in each other within the band. So, for example, if we're putting drums down, quite happy to let Nick do his thing. Because um, he knows kind of the sort of stuff that we like, and we've because we've spoken about it, we've sat in studios when he's been doing the drums. So, and there's that element. There's an element of trust there in the relationship. There, you know, we know that Nick will kind of, you know, he he'll be in the ballpark certainly. With, with sure, and it's the same for all of us really. There's a lot of trust um, between the members of the band. You know, mu- musical trust between the members of the band. Greg's songs tend to be a little bit more open ended in the demo phases, and uh, so he will. Um, they're not as nailed down as mine, but I come from a kind of songwriting background where I was signed as a songwriter to Rondor Music UK, and that was the publishing arm of A&M Records, Alpert and Moss back in the day. So they got bands like Carpenters, Supertrack, right. and Sting, all those sorts of things. And um, 
So I'm used to kind of like nailing things down uh, very specifically, you know, because um, that's just the background I come from. So my demos tend to be um, quite um, quite developed, you know. And yeah. That- so, David, one of the reasons I was asking, and then I'll let Tom take back over after you answer this, but I, I'm really, when I watch you guys, so I've never actually been in the concert to see you live, but when I've watched your live performances online, I'm always struck by how it's clear that Greg is this kind of just, he, he's a, a great pillar there in the middle of everything and, and things kind of revolve around him. You're clearly the lead in terms of being the voice uh, as well as the face of the band. But it strikes me that you two kind of establish these these twin pillars and everything else kind of rotates around it. And it, it, it does seem to me at least that that trust is almost palpable from the standpoint of a, of a listener or a watcher. And I, I find that one of the most amazing things because it, it comes, at least as I'm watching you, it's as close to jazz as I've ever seen a rock band. Oh, wow. Okay. Danny, Danny will be very pleased with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the real jazzer. And, and yeah. And I think I mean, we all bring different qualities to different things. For, for example, Dave Gregory and Danny Manners, they tend to, they're very good at, uh, work. They're good ensemble players, and Danny's good at, mus- at, at developing and, and arranging things around things. So we've all got our skills, but right. always the, the twin pillars of Greg and I. Yes, I guess it's because uh, since I joined the band back in two thousand and nine, it, it, yes, it has been. We've kind of uh, we are, we are at the centre of it, really. Yeah, we do. That's what I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, and so would Greg. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks, David. All right, I'd like to ask. If you, given that over the past few years, of course, the progressive rock community has started to hear more and more about you guys and the word has started to to get out a bit more, but do you consider yourself to be a musician in the progressive rock tradition? Do you consider what Big Big Train is doing to be progressive rock? And if so, what does that term mean to you? Okay, well, okay. Well, yes, I do. Uh, I, I, Big Big Train, uh, Greg and I, were very proud to be progressive rock musicians the nicest thing about working in the progressive genre is that we, it can be what you make it in many ways. Um, I think because progressive rock doesn't kind of exist in its own bubble, it's usually, usually things impact upon it. Uh, so for example, Brad, Brad mentioned jazz earlier on. There's certainly a lot of that in there. There's, um, there's rock, obviously, and there's psychedelic rock and there's uh, electronica and all sorts of things that come, have come down classical music, particularly the way the songs form extended forms and things like that. So it's a great vehicle uh, to, to to be a musician within, and um, it affords us to be able to, ex- to to write extended pieces of music. It's very much, uh, a, I guess, working on on a, on, a, on a progressive rock album or a long progressive rock track is akin to working on uh, a novel or something like that, with the amount of detail and uh, research that goes into it, subject matter, and then you've got the musical developments, the way. It, the way the themes develop throughout the, the piece and the way the, the piece illustrates the narrative, the, the music illustrates the narrative of the story. So um, that's what it means to me. It means that it's a really adventurous sonic playground to be a progressive rock musician, but we're not, we've never been a band that shied away from being tagged progressive um, because that's, that's what we are. And that's it. Yeah, I ask that because there are some bands that, as you know, the, the term is almost radioactive to them, maybe because they think it for some people it just sets off alarm bells like they think about spinal tap and bands <laughs> that are trying too hard you know <laughs> so 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 but but to me i i love the genre and i guess i i was going to ask you this as a question but it would have been such a leading question i'll just say it as a statement okay i i have friends who are de- very dear to me who are very very intelligent and yet their entire musical experience consists of pop songs by Billy Joel. Now, look, when you want to listen to a pop song, you know, there's nobody better. He, he, he wrote amazing uh, melodies that are very memorable. He was very successful. I'm not trying to put him down. Oh. But you're depriving yourself of something really, really special if that's your exposure to what music is. And to, I mean, to hear what you guys have done is such a, again, has added such joy to my life. It's not just that I tap my feet a little bit listening and, and then that's the end of it. Listening to Curator of Butterflies is yes. a really amazing experience. You know, it's not, it's not like Uptown Girl. No. It, there's there's so much more to it. Not like Uptown Girl, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, 
Yeah, but that's the thing. But it, people come to music for very different reasons, and it fulfills very different needs in their lives. And uh, I think it's just each to their own, really, Tom. It's just a, it's, it's just each to their own. And um, yeah, we're lucky that we have people that believe in what we do and like it enough to to enable us to continue to do it. So. Well, let's talk about the new album, Grand Tour. Now, as I've said, um, I jumped on board the train, so to speak, at English Electric, which impressed me musically and lyrically. The, the, the scenes that are painted there of life in England are scenes that could be painted by people only, you know, who had really had those experiences. And, and it's, it was subject matter that we don't really encounter very much in, in music these days. So that also drew me in. Well, here, the subject matter is uh, is very distinct and obvious. I'm just interested in how you decided on what you decided on for Grand Tour, where it really is a Grand Tour of Europe. Okay, well, um, the notion to, to do the Grand Tour, the title came after, uh, well, Greg and I are kind of continually writing most of the time, and uh, because you just do, you know, you just kind of, it keeps, it's not something that you switch off, it's something that keeps going or you get ideas or we'll go and see things uh, individually and sometimes c- together we'll go off and look at something or, or and we'll be struck by a certain thing so already the, the, this process has begun now for the the, the, the next album so work Greg and I are already kind of like building together kind of, uh, themes if you like um, things that suddenly connect and I don't know, I don't know um, it's a bit like it's an odd thing when you're working on a record because suddenly th- so suddenly you get these connections with other things. Other things seem to spring out the woodwork, almost like coincidentally, but they're not. It's the fact that because you're working on a particular theme, then something else will happen. For example, Greg had been doing a lot of traveling in Europe and he'd been visiting Rome quite a lot. So that's why his interest in Rome over the last few years has, has developed. So it was inevitable that he was going to do that. Uh, Grand Tour also coincided with um, us being offered to headline Lorelei uh, in Germany as well. So we ha- we ha- we're in the, the, we found ourselves suddenly having to deal with voyaging across to Germany, t- bringing everything with the band out there and doing it. So learning how to to uh, you know to go s- to foreign places, and it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. So we knew this was on the horizon. So that flavoured the album uh, in a little while. Um, in part of it anyway, it flavoured the album. So um, that's what that's what it's like. It's just get, it's pulling themes together. So Greg will say, "I'm writing about this," and then I'll say, "I'm writing about this." So it's interesting because we both cross reference ourselves a little bit as well within each, within the song. <laughs> and um, so that's nice because again, we keep making. Um, for example, on Voyager, for example, there's a I wrote a song on on Grand Tour called Ariel, and Greg's got one called Voyager about the Voyager space. <laughs> One of the moons that Voyager took uh, detailed accounts of is a planet called Ariel. So these little th- these, these little things suddenly have this, these resonances and connections, things like that. But yeah, we we eventually decide what what kind of things we're writing, and then we'll decide quite quickly in that process of a, of a title. And I think in in the instance of the Grand Tour, I liked the um, the idea of the Grand Tour being the sort of the, the uh, 19th century. Um, well, last 200 years, so 18th and 19th century pursuit of well-to-do young British people going out into Europe. It's a bit like a rite of passage. They go and visit different things to to broaden the mind. And also, in some cases, if they're about to inherit titles to actually kind of sow their wild oats before they came back to the, the UK <laughs> to take up the, their duties in either government or gentry or whatever. Um, so I, I mentioned that to Greg, and he thought that was a good idea. And we all we needed... The um, the grand tour really is is it's just an arc, a uh, story arc, something that we could hang these stories on. It's not um, a step by step guide to Europe and things like that, because most of the people's grand tours are very different. For example, Lord Byron's tour was very off the beaten track. It wasn't all the usual places. You know, it was, it was a different thing. So that's it. So once we've got the story in place, and once we've got the title of the album, it's a bit like putting. I'm often likening this to putting. The name on a, on the front of a bus or something like that. When you see when you've got a bus and you've got a name on front of it, you kind of know where you're headed, and that that kind of um, consolidates lots of the ideas. And that's how we do it. So that's it. Once the title's in place, we're off. Really. 
Brad has written a nice review of Grand Tour. So, Brad, in a second, I'm going to let you pick up the conversation. But I'll say I'm one of these listeners who knows nothing about music. So when you guys are doing all these clever things, I have no idea how clever it is. I just know it sounds really nice. So I'm sure you're up to things that are that are really impressive and amazing. But I, I want uh, Brad to talk in particular about this, this, uh, this current release Grand Tour a, a bit because he – uh, you know, Brad's been with Progarchy for a long time, and I think as long as I've been following Big Big Train, Brad gets mentioned in the liner notes every darn time. It makes me envious. <laughs> I'm always very proud of that. I will. I will admit that, um, David. Think your answers are just fantastic, and it, it's drawing me in all kinds of places. I wasn't expecting to go this morning, but you know, one of the things you, two of the things you said uh, that when you look at music, you think of each to their own. And you also think of this sonic playground. But when I think of big, big train, I mean, both of those things I think are clear, but there's a real, there's a real optimism or an uplift in the way that you present music that as far as I've seen, never, never becomes pretension. It's always just so earnest and honest. And I like thinking of big, big train. I mean, prog is great. And I, I'm, I'm a prog rocker. I've been a prog rocker since as far back as I can remember. But I often think of big, big train as actually taking things to the next step beyond prog. Uh, and that is, it, it strikes me that so much of what you're doing is really intelligent, serious music for intelligent, serious people. And without it ever being pretentious. So I'm curious, do you, is that just your personality? And I know that it could be a loaded question, but is this, do you and Greg sit around and think, well, this would be a great topic and we need to explore this because it's a big, big train topic? Or is it really more just an expression of what you two are interested in at the moment? And it's then an earnest manifestation of that. Well, we, we're like that. That's what a lot of the conversations that Greg and I have. We're not we're not trying to be something that we're not, Brad. That's the point. Right. We, I think that's um, it's one one of the things I've learned in life is that you know people can get very wise to that very quickly. And um, both Greg and I are fifty three at the moment, and we are we're at a point where you, we've got to be true to ourselves. You know, it's that it's being true to yourself and writing about things that uh, stir us. So um, yeah, it's it's us. It's not contrived. We don't try. We don't try to be big, big train. It's it's the way we are. We are big, big train. So that that's it's not um, it's not something we have to work ha- work hard yeah. at. No, that, that's a that's a perfect answer. So I'm just I'm about a year and a half younger than you guys. I figured we were roughly the same age. So let me let me ask about Grand Tour, and I love Tom's question about it. Where where do you see it? And so I started with you guys, and obviously I have everything now. But I started with you with Underfall Yard. And I've been able to watch over 10 years your trajectory and then, of course, projecting backwards as well. So Grand Tour, uh, I have to admit, the first time I listened to it, I, I just wasn't sure what was going on. And even the second time. And it really it took until Tom and I talked about it for it to really click with me. And then once it clicked. I thought, oh my gosh, this is just genius. And I, I'm there now, but I am still kind of surprised that you chose to write about a European topic, especially since Big Big Train is so identified with England. Do you see yourselves going into the next album? Could it go in a totally different direction? You know, here on this album, you went back in time, you go forward in time, you go out in space, you go back in space. You know, is this just what we should expect in future releases? I don't know. It's all it's all to be had. It depends which way the wind blows really good. It depends what we feel like writing, what, what strikes us. There's more stuff to be discussed, we think. I mean, we've already got ideas for the next record. Uh, so we'll just, you know, you, you follow your muse, you know, you, you go where it leads you. That's another thing as well, you know, just, just being open to, to, to where it takes you. I do think um, Grand Tour is, at least coming back to saying it takes you a few times to listen to it, that we, we wanted to do that. It took a, a this time around, it took an awful, awfully long amount of time to write. The writing process seemed to go on a lot longer than it had in any of the in any of the, the earlier. Oh, that's records. interesting. Okay, I think that's because we were trying to not fall back into the traps of doing the same old, same old. Because we were also going out into Europe doing Lorelei, and we're looking at doing uh, the States next year right. and looking into all of that. 
Um, well, we're, we're you know we're planning to do it. That's that's at that point. Um, it's this idea of reaching out. So it's the idea of a very kind of English culturally English based band. Even though Nick's from uh, the, from the states and Rick was from Sweden, it's the idea of us traveling, going out, seeing the world, living life, embracing life while it's there to be had. You know that's that was the uh, that was the motive behind it. But Grand Tour is a is a very dense record. There's a lot of it. There's yes. there's a lot to listen to. It's there's a if you can go in as deep as you like. And that was the thing. We were building layer upon layer of kind of, of depth and intrigue. So superficially you could listen to something like Theodora or you could listen to uh, Alive and you that's a that's quite a happy little toe tapping song. <laughs> yes it is. <laughs> no doubt about that. Yeah as a matter of fact in preparation for this I got an advanced copy of the album. So it so happened I was in New York City at the time and I was walking down the streets of Manhattan and Alive would come on my iPod. And I'm telling you, that combination of the bustle of the city and having and taking a brisk walk and having a live play in the background, and you're in a city that for all its flaws is full of life. It is full of life. And and when you really enjoy all the good things about the city, the, the theater and the culture and just the vibrancy, it, it is great to be alive. And with that song playing in the background, it was such a nice... Uh, uh, setting for for my for my trip there, I can't help asking, and I, I I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way, but over the past few years, Stephen Wilson has started to break out a little bit more into the mainstream, and yeah. yet still most people have never heard of him. But yet he's much much better known than he was before. And I want an, I want Big Big Train to have that moment. I, I consider it to be seriously one of the most. And I'm not saying this to kiss up to the guest. I don't kiss up to my guests. But for heaven's <laughs> sake, I think you guys are producing some of the best music I have ever heard. And it is a crime that you guys aren't a household name. And that instead, just the most forgettable pap is all over the airwaves. Do you ever find that frustrating? No, because there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> That's just the right attitude. But, you know, the world the world is what it is, and things either strike a chord at a particular time. Um, I don't feel like uh, I don't feel like I'm owed a living, and I don't feel like I'm in, you know I'm by some sort of uh, I'm owed it by any particular right or claim on it. I think it it finds it its natural um, balance in things. Uh, it is it is what it is, and we are where we are. I would yeah, I would like to. Obviously, we want to grow the band. We want to be able to be more successful. We want to be able to tour more, um, you know, see more of the world and do and, and write the things we we love. We're currently um, looking to develop the label as well in terms of uh, productions, and I'm, I'm I'm working on a record with Judy Dybel, who's the first singer in Fairport Convention, and I've been writing with Judy for a few years, and uh, so that's something that's going to come out on English Electric. So. There's lots of things to be had, wow. but don't feel bitter or twisted that, you know, I don't feel, you know, it, it, it is what it is. And I'm uh, at the age I am, I'm very, I'm saying for Greg, really, you know, we're, we're, we're not, such, yeah, the, we know who we are and, uh, you know, we're, we're just making the best music that we can. And thank you for saying that you, you think the music's the, some of the best music you, you've heard. And that's genuinely uh, very, very, I'm pleased you, I'm pleased you think that way. Um, all we're trying to do is just make the best records we can with what we've got while we can, and and that's it. It's uh, it's quite simple, really. It's not it's not it's not a difficult thing. It's, uh, well, it's I, sticking to it. I would say that you guys are, in addition to being like, it's not just thinking man's music. Although Brad is right about that, it certainly is. Uh, but it's it's also a musician's music in the sense that when I've promoted Big Big Train to my audience, what I've found is the people who are the most accomplish themselves as musicians are the ones who most appreciate what you're doing. And, and in fact, uh, a friend of mine, James Newcomb, who has a uh, musical podcast, had you on as a guest some time ago, and he heard about you uh, through me. Yeah. And he's very knowledgeable about music. So the musicians listen to what you're doing and say, oh my gosh, how have I not heard of this group before? So I just I just wanted to add that in. Brad, uh, let, let's get back to the, let's ask a couple more things before we wrap up, uh, just about the new album what's well first of all uh, david what's the exact release date on it it's um it's going to be on may the 17th is the exact release date two days oh. yeah okay yeah well two days from when we're recording but by the time people right. hear this it will be released so they'll have no further excuse not to get it all right brad over to you oh so, no this, go ahead david i'm sorry greg's birthday as well it's the same the release date for, for grand tour is the same day as greg's birthday 
Terrific. <laughs> That's great. Oh, David, I, it's fun listening to you. I think I'm, uh, I like you guys even better than I did uh, 35 minutes ago. This is great. So uh, I, I want to ask too, and I, I love this news that you're bringing in, that you're going to do something with the label and you're taking things further. Uh, I think that's just excellent. And I, I loved your responses. So you know, following up on what Tom just asked, how do you want to come into America? How do you guys want to come here? What are you going to come here on the grand tour tour? Are you thinking it'll be the next album? And you know, how many cities are you looking at when you come to North America? Well, we're planning it at the moment, Brad. So we're looking at how we're going to do that. We've got to think about um, getting everybody over. We've got to look at whether or not, you know, how the brass will, um, how sure. will uh, which it will figure in. But we're just wondering whether or not to bring our own brass guys with us or bring um, or maybe hire musicians from the state side. We don't know yet. Cause it's good, it's the great thing about having Nick in the States is that, you know, we can get things moving that, that way. We do have, we're in, we're, we've uh, been announced to play a, a particular festival uh, as well in, in, the, in the States, in Florida. So um, that's good. So that, that's how we'll do it. But in terms of what we will bring, I think, I, I'm not, I don't know about you, but I think we're almost like going to do sort of a big, big train kind of greatest hits sort of a, a thing rather than it being just solely songs from Grand Tour. We're probably going to play songs from uh, that people would probably expect us to see stuff that has made us uh, put us where we are kind of thing. So uh, we'll probably do something like that. That's the strategy so far. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. So you know, one of the one of uh, a band that I like quite a bit, and I think Tom does as well, Glass Hammer, which comes out of Tennessee here. I know even when they tour in the United States, they almost always hire college bands or college choirs to work with them so that they, wherever they go, they've got built-in musicians there. And I, I could definitely see you guys doing that as you come over. I think that would be a, a great way to mix with some, not only people who know what they're doing here in the U.S., uh, but people that you could trust and support. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to that, David. I think that's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Just wonderful. I'll probably, be, I'll probably be a groupie. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just follow along from place to place. So, yeah. Um, so let me ask a, another question about Grand Tour. And it strikes me, and I don't know if this was you or Greg, but how do you guys how do you guys decide on song arrangements? So this one on Grand Tour struck me a lot like what you did on English Electric. So English Electric. And you and I had corresponded about this, David, though it's been a while. You know, I, I felt like it started with this kind of childhood enthusiasm, uh, justly so, and ends with basically the end of life. You've got the whole life cycle there. On the Grand Tour, uh, we start in space and then end up in home. And I, I'm curious if that was intentional on your part. You know, does this, do you work with Rob Aubrey as you're thinking about which way the songs go? Uh, how, do you, how do you guys decide that? Okay, well, it's mainly, it is, it's devised predominantly between Greg and I. And then we will kind of like find the story arcs between them. But Greg's very attentive to running order and things like that. That's, that's, that's something that he likes to do. Uh, but yeah, basically it's, 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 a, it's Greg and I that will, we decide on how it goes. We also arrange the songs as well. Not unless we get someone else in, for example, Danny or something like that. And yeah, you know, Greg will say, oh, could you arrange this bit for that? I think the strings, I think some of the strings on Voyager, Danny did the string charts when we went into Abbey Road Studio 2 and recorded the strings. You know, it's that kind of thing. So, Dan, you know, we've got some we've got some uh, very talented people in, in Big Big Train. And, of course, Rachel does string arrangements as well. So right. Uh, there's, uh, the, we, you know, that's how it, it works. But, no, it's usually in-house. We don't have anybody external coming in and, uh, and doing it. We, we do it all ourselves. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and please only answer this if you can, David. I'm curious as a business, how do you guys, uh, do you have equal shares? Are you shareholders in Big Big Train? Or do you do things by uh, how things come in and then you divide profits? Well, there, we, we've, got a, we've got a company, we're a limited company called Big Big Train Limited. Okay. And Greg and I are the directors of that company. So, and the rest of the musicians are paid. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for answering that. I'm sure that may have been an awkward question, but I appreciate knowing that. Oh, you know what? Let me jump in with an unrelated question. How do you feel about streaming services? Because we hear a lot of musicians complaining about them, that they, they don't earn very much and they feel like they're being exploited. What's your feeling? Because, by the way, the, the first first Big Big Train song I heard was on Pandora. I heard uh, the first Rebreather. And for most progressive music, I have to listen to it 10 times before I really get it. 
that one I loved instantly, okay. and it was through Pandora. Okay. Well, they are, you know, certainly a double edged sword type of thing. Um, you know, we are aware of these things. You know, we could, I think, like Spotify and, and, and downloading and things like that. Just because some people download stuff doesn't necessarily, uh, some people think, oh, they're ripping it off the net. It's one thing, it's one thing having it. Progressive rock fans, in, in our experience, tend to like the actual article. So within our genre, uh, they will like the package, which is why we put lots of um, thought and attention into the artwork, which is why we work with Sarah, Sarah Ewing, our artist. You know, we, we try and make the thing as desirable as possible so that people will want that because we know that people in our, our genre like those sorts of things. But as you've, if you said, Tom, you were listening to, uh, you know, you were listening to, you know, you, you check things out. And I think that's a good thing for, for Spotify in the sense if people want to kind of be exposed to new music. But I'm from a generation, um, maybe you're asking the wrong person, I'm from a generation where, you know, I actually liked the artifacts as well. You know, I, I, I like the, uh, the packaging. You can get some beautifully made musical product these days you just you just do and um uh, so each to their own really if if spotify helps people helps more people listen to our music then fine when we went to lorelei we were struck by the um the age difference uh in in europe of uh, of um people come to see us there's a lot more younger people into progressive rock music and um we, we noticed that there was quite a lot of young people wearing big big train merch coming in uh, to Lorelei with the merch, you know, on t-shirts and things like that. So it's just, um, I'm, I'm not sure how they're hearing our, our, our material. And the good thing about it as well, I think a lot of these kind of, kind of sites, like I'm sure Spotify and, and, and many others actually um, keep data. So in terms of who's buying it or who's downloading it and what from where. So that's really useful to kind of build, build up a profile so we can see uh, from country to country where our, you know, who's kind of buying our, our music. So it's a double-edged sword. I think it's just, uh, it's, it's just one of the perils of being a musician in the 21st century, but it's got good things about it and it's got bad things about it. Right, right, right. All right. I'd like to ask uh, Brad, let's each ask one, one more question. Mine is a question I actually asked Ian Anderson back on episode three of, of this show. This is episode number 1409. So this was a while ago <laughs> that I had Ian Anderson on, but, but I asked him, when you look back at the chart history of, of some of the early uh, Jethro Tull albums, but particularly the two they did where the entire album was one song, Thick as a Brick and A Passion Play, those both reached number one on the Billboard charts in the United States, which is an astonishing thing. I mean, they did have radio edits, but even so, I mean, I, I, I consider that an impossibility today that you would release an album that's clearly progressive – that's challenging to the listener. The whole album is one song and they reached number one. And I asked him, how do you account for that when we know full well that today that could never happen? And, you know, I, I get very defensive when it comes to my music. I want my musicians to be successful and world famous and it annoys me when when they're not always that way. And, and so what I was trying to get him to say was, well, people have gotten stupider. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Something kind of like that. And that's just not his style. He wasn't going, he wasn't taking the bait. And I don't think that's David's style either. But I am curious to know, David, what do you think has changed? That that that, that seems like something from another planet to us today. And yet it did happen. What's different between then and now? I guess because uh, the at that time, the music industry, in order to get your music out, you had to be signed to a label. You had to have the, the weight of the label. And there were only, only a few sources where you could get that music from which for them it's like um in money terms and it was like shooting fish in a barrel you know they got a captive audience and that and i think because you're talking things like well thick as a brick and a passion play uh, which followed on the heels of each other as well it wasn't like they did it and then did a kind of a few kind of standard kind of song formatted records in between they did them on the heels of each other um uh, which is a which is an odd thing so what's, what's changed, I think, in music is the way that people listen to music and the way that people interact with music these days. I mean, I don't know. Could, could you release an album today where it's just what, one long continuous track? In terms of format, you could, because in the olden days, it would have been split in the half by vinyl. So you've got Thick as a Brick Part 1, Thick as a Brick Part 2, simply because of the limitations of the format. And not actually talking about vinyl, but you could, um, you could do an album where it is just literally a continuous piece of music. Like uh, whatever, a fifty-minute piece of music. If you wanted to do that, imagine mixing it though. That'd be a nightmare. But um, <laughs> I suppose um, why they why they could why why they got away with it then? 
I think it's because the labels have put time and money into to developing the bands. The bands were continually on tour on both sides of the app for, for, for a lot of time. And I think it's because they were um, they were trying to do something a bit different, something um, and Ian Anson certainly said about Thick as a Brit. You know, I think out on the heels of, um, was it Aqu- Aqualung, I think, uh, before Thick as a Brick? Yeah. He, they thought that was a contact record. It's got, it's a song title, I guess. So it's got themes that, that connect it together. But he thought in, in Thick as a Brick, he would give them the mothers, the mother of all concept albums. That's what his, his idea was. I don't know. Um, could, it could, maybe that, maybe that's, the, could be the next record. Maybe we, a Bigby train could make that one continue. Oh, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> if that happens, I take full credit. For yeah. that. All right. <laughs> Brad, one final question from you. Yeah. Or, David, uh, Thank you so much for all of this. Your time, everything. You're so gracious. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's nice to be able to talk to one of my musical heroes, too. So my final question is this. Um, Obviously, uh, 50 years from now, probably none of us will be here. But somebody will take our place and somebody will be writing the history of rock music over the previous 100 years. How would you like to be remembered in the history of rock music 50 years from now? Oh, uh, that's, 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 a, that's a tricky question, Brad. Uh, <laughs> it was meant to be. <laughs> what would I like to be remembered? Um, I would like to be remembered fondly and affectionately by my daughters. How I'm remembered for the music I do, it's uh, it's whatever. <laughs> it's whatever that, you know, whatever gets written about us or however I'm remembered. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to be around to, to pick anybody <laughs> up. So, David, that was a perfect answer. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, I, I want to uh, urge people to check out uh, the new album, of course, Grand Tour. BigBigTrain.com is the website. I'm going to link to the album. Uh, I'm also going to link to – I know I shouldn't because we're supposed to be – you know, your marketing people be upset at me because we're supposed to focus on Grand Tour. But doggone it, I have to link to English Electric. As long as I have people's attention, I'm also going to link to that at TomWoods.com slash 1409. And I this is your great entry point into – a band that has given me tremendous joy, my children, Brad Berzer, who has impeccable taste 90% of the time, I'd say, <laughs> nine out of 10 times. You know, every once in a while, there's a dud coming from, from Brad. But but honestly, if it hadn't been for Brad, again, my life would would not be as happy as it is. So I, I want people to to who normally trust me on other things, you know, on things involving, you know, world historic happenings, well, forget all those. This is really where you need to trust me, right here on, on a way that is going to improve your life. So I, I hope you have uh, you continue to, to uh, get more exposure, have great success with it. And, uh, and as Brad says, thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for speaking today. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Brad. It's oh, so thank you. Um, it's, been, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Definitely, definitely, definitely check out tomwoods.com slash 1409 to make your life better. I'm telling you, you're going to thank me. You are going to thank me. TomWoods.com slash 1409. All right, that's it, everybody. I'll see you next week. Thanks so much for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.